York's classic rock, Q1043. Ken Dash has Beatles Revolution in the story, in the supernatural story of success that you would think maybe wouldn't have happened, but sheer drive and determination. Multi, multi platinum gajillion award winning singer, songwriter, guy from the West Prairie of the upper Great White North, Mr. Randy Bachman. Welcome to Q104.3. The Great White North. Good day, eh? Good day, eh? What, what did what did Canadians think of that show? What did they think of of that of Rick Moranis and that was us? Are you kidding? It was fabulous. <laughs> it was great. I mean, it was a little. It was a little. It was almost like a cartoon of a Canadian wearing the toques and doing that doing that little thing. That's what we all are: <laughs> cigarettes, coffee, and discussing. My favorite argument was, you know, you guys in the lower forty-eight, you call it back bacon. So I guess up here, instead of calling it American cheese, we should call it back cheese. And they just were discussing that and very seriously and heavy. And then you get Getty Lee adding in doing their 12 days of Christmas. Right. Come on. My true love gave to me a beer. Yeah. It, it, you can't do that. It's phenomenal. <laughs> How are you? Really good. How are you? I haven't seen you since Sunday. Yeah. Randy and I went out for dinner because we enjoy great food. And he has just come from a great... Great New York landmark. You know, he likes to tour American landmarks, especially in New York City. There's so much to be grateful and famous for. So he's just come from Katz's Deli. How are you going to smuggle chopped liver back to Canada? Have you figured this out yet? So to my daughter, can I take a salami or chopped liver? She's, are you kidding? You'll be starting on border, border <laughs> security, you know, where they arrest everybody. And she tried to bring from England once uh, little things that make gravy, like little dried, what was it? What's it called? The... Bisto gravy pods. They wouldn't let her bring it in. So I meet byproduct. So you get arrested. So I have to wait till I get home to Winnipeg and get some kosher blue label salami or something. Can you find good kosher deli in Canada? Yeah. Uh, Winnipeg's just like Chicago. Really? Yeah. It's like a cattle town where the trains went through both both trains. Right. Yeah. I grew up in the Jewish part of Winnipeg. Really? I'm telling you, I went to the YMHA when I was a kid. Yeah. Did you really? Yeah. Wow. That's so cool. And it's got Paul Schaefer for a good friend. You've been to Passover Schaefer, dinner. Yeah. yeah. So here's what you do. Samuel Hager. <laughs> here's how we're going to get his salami in. I said, tape it to his pants. And then if somebody says something, just say, hey, it's a rock star thing. Me, Motley Crue, we all do that. It's not food. It's just for adornment. That's yeah. what we Maybe it'll work. You never know. I'll call you when I'm arrested. I'll, I'll You'll be the man. one phone call that I get. <laughs> Ken, it didn't work. I'm in jail. <laughs> Rant, there's a documentary is out today about Randy Bachman, interestingly called Bachman. And your story, may, while it's not unique, it's something about determination. And it's something, <clears throat> excuse me, to share with Andrew, who's my producer, Andrew, who's starting in a band. He's got a band, 100,000, 100,000. Got it right this time. And we're talking about how you get from starting a band to becoming like one of the biggest, most successful you know, performers in our world. You know, you've written songs. There's this collection of songs that just sit there. I love so much of your catalog. Like, I love Billy Joel or Bruce, but there's there's Born to Run, there's Stairway to Heaven, there's Taking Care of Business, there's American Woman. There's a shelf that these things sit on that never, never, never go out of style. They become, and this is not poo-pooing, it's like a hamburger, it's not, it's a, you can dress it up or whatever, but it's just always there. That's what the sound of our music is. You built the house with it. And how you got there, and there's a story that you told me, I hope you wouldn't mind repeating, about your dad, uh, who's an optometrist, was yes, it? Yes, yeah. In eyeglass business, <clears throat> about after the Guess Who kind of came apart and him asking you to come back into the family business. Well, my dad always had this dream, right? My brother Tim did that after he left BTO. He went back and was an optician with my dad. I d that wasn't my... I had no fallback plan. My plan B was stick to plan A. So that was kind of it. I just I was just music, music, music. Well, so you, my dad would say, you got to get a real job. You like to work at nothing all day. These lines aren't taking care of business. You like to work at nothing all day. People think, see, you're having fun lying in the sun. I'm going, I'm thinking about music. I'm lying in the sun, but I, I'm composing in my head, you know? And that was his whole thing. You had said, if I'm going to fall, I want to fall on my face, not on my yeah, ass. Yeah, if you're going to fall, go fall big. Like, climb up a mountain and fall. 
fall so bad that somebody's going to talk about it. If you want to make it your band, it. you've got to fire 995,000 guys. <laughs> Pick five guys and have your band. You can't have 100,000 guys. <laughs> You know, and we think the, the split won't work, you know? <laughs> right now, we've discussed. It's a million yeah. bucks, you're going to get 10 yeah. bucks each, you know? It, it's funny. We talk we're on a subscription model where they pay to be in the band. Yeah. yeah. We were just talking uh, two weeks ago in our podcast, we were talking about band names. Band names that we thought are great, and does the band name matter? Because I said to Andrew, I don't like 100000 for a band name. It doesn't tell me anything about the music. And then we brought up, you know, the who and the guess who don't tell me anything about the music either. Like it doesn't say, oh, it's going to be hard and loud. The Beatles, I thought when they put in the A, that became one of the greatest names in the world. Because instead of just the Beatles like the crickets, there's a beat. And then the Mersey Beats, the swinging blue jeans. You know it's going to be you know, a rhythm-based band, just something like that. Pink Floyd, as soon as you go to colors, you know it's going to be something kind of spacey, even though you don't know where the origin came from. The Guess Who... I have no idea what that's going to sound like. I don't even know what the band's name is. So we were able to sound like anything. Did you hate Listen that the name? Guess Who albums. There's a an acid rock, jazz, Jim Morrison chanting thing with Cummings, and there's a feedback song, and then there's a cute little Ubla D kind of song, and then there's a ballad, These Eyes, and then there's a Buffalo Springfield song like uh, No Time, and then there's a one riff song like Whole Lot of Love, That's American Woman. We just were able to do anything. <clears throat> the name didn't put us in a box. But were you afraid when you were starting out? Did you say, well, but that won't get us on the radio. People won't know our name. No, we were called Chad Allen and the Reflections. That was your first band we see We in the couldn't use the name because of just like Romeo and Juliet, you know, the band called the Reflections. We got a name, the Expressions, because it sounded the same. <laughs> there was a band called the Expressions <laughs> on Motown. We sent in this song, Shake on All Over. The record label said, get a name. You got a week. We want to release it. So it'll be part of the British Invasion. We go to the library. There's no internet. Then we get every book we can on butterflies and birds. They're used by every doo-wop band. The <laughs> Orioles, the Ravens, the the, the Monarchs, you know, the Viceroys. Every name is used by doo-wop band. We said we can't find a name. And they said, that's it. We're putting out the label. A white label. We're going to put 50 copies out. Shake it over underneath. We're going to put Guess Who? Find a name. It comes out. It goes to number one. Everyone thinks it's the British Invasion. DJ's just saying... This is a British record, and it's Brian Jones on lead guitar, and it's <laughs> Keith Richard doing this, and it's this guy from the Yardbirds doing that. It's a British supergroup, and they can't use their names because they get sued. And so it goes to number one, and that's our name, the Guess Who. So the myth of who it could have been actually fueled this amazing song. I mean, your right. recording Shaking All Over is great, but the myth that you created accidentally behind right. it. And then we went to England in 67. Uh, saw the Who at the Marquee Club, sat down with John and Pete, and said, you can't use the name anymore. We're the Guess Who. And they said, oh, bugger off. The, <laughs> there's the birds and the yard birds. There can be the Who and the Guess Who. And we said, okay. <laughs> that became an ongoing joke. Like, we'd be flying from L.A. to London to do Top of the Pops, and the Who would be flying from London to L.A. to do a show at the Forum, and we'd all stop at, like, LaGuardia or Kennedy, which was the air, in-between yeah, airport when you're right, trying, flying flame. ocean. And, the, and I would check in, the guy would go, oh, the other members of your band are here. They got here two hours ago. Well, who's that? Well, John Entwistle. So I would phone John Entwistle's room. And he's like, groggy, it's three in the morning. Hello, John, this is Randy Backman from the Guess Who? Bugger off. And I'd slam down the phone. It's like a Monty Python skit. <laughs> then two weeks later, they'd phone me. This is John, bugger off. They'd slam the thing down. So that was like a, an ongoing joke for you. And then I played with John Entwistle in on the Ringo Starr's All-Star Band. Oh, that's and hilarious. And we're introducing each other at a theater where we're rehearsing. We walk, and Ringo's trying to get everybody together and have camaraderie there, and it's Mark Farner and Billy Preston. And I walk up to John, and he walk, we shake hands. We go, look each other's eyes and say, bugger <laughs> off. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> funny. So were people showing up to shows thinking that you were going to be Mick Jones and that Keith Richards was in the band? or Well, it was basically, it happened so fast. I went, in two weeks, we went to number one, in, in the, and we were playing in Winnipeg, Calling people saying it's us, the guess who's us because they <laughs> knew us in Winnipeg as Chad on the expressions. That's that's really me on guitar. No, it's not, it's Brian Jones. You know, well, Brian Jones didn't play guitar, he played sitar and Ruby right. Tuesday, the little flute and stuff, but uh, nobody got it. Well, but then we got a call to go be uh, to tour with Louis Louis, the Kingsman, in 1965. So we quit school uh, like middle of June, just before final exams, and just came down here and went on tour with Dion and the Belmonts, you know, Dion DiMucci, and yeah. And uh, and the Kingsman, Louis Louis, was great. I never went home. I'm still here. <laughs> so 
<laughs> was it a you know for real? Was it a heavy decision to quit school and and no. or just not a second thought? School to me was not working. Got it. Stay in school. Draw a picture. Add two plus two. You don't <laughs> nah. have to because I was working, playing a job. My dad kept saying, "Get a real job, son. I got you a job. You're starting at Simpson Sears selling suits this Friday. What do you mean? I have a gig this Friday. How much are we getting at Sears? Two seventy an hour. Well, I'm playing a gig for twenty five bucks. It's okay. You're going to have a real job. So I show there at four thirty. I get a break at seven thirty. You get a little break till nine o'clock. I get a break. I never go back to work. I go to my gig. I come home. My dad says, what happened? You didn't. You took a dinner break. You didn't go back. I said, how much did I make at dinner break? He goes, well, you made like eight seventy five, and you take this off. So you made five and a half dollars. I said, well, I went and played a dance and got 25 bucks. My dad was making $65 a week then, raising four sons. Yeah. And he kept saying, you got to get a real job. It's so funny how that, especially we go back to the Beatle days, post World War II, you're just coming out of it. The, your whole city has been bombed. You know, the, the shelters, the, the Cavern Club is was a bomb shelter. And when you've got nothing, as you always said, either go to school and get an education, go to university, or you're going to go work in the shipyards if you live in Liverpool. Nobody, the, Ozzy said that. The biggest thing, the Beatles and people, how was Black Sabbath in, you know, influenced by the Beatles? He said, nobody knew there was a third way out. Either you went to university or, you know, if you were in Birmingham, you went to work in the steel mills or something. He says, nobody thought, this is something you did on the weekend for 20 bucks. Nobody thought you could make a career. But when somebody, in the, when Northerners did it, we just thought maybe a London, Cliff Richard and the Shadows could do it, but not a bunch of punters. When the Beatles did it, like, well, we could be like the horror movie Beatles. You want to try that? We'll play everything in a minor key. Yeah, because we can't go to university, and I, but T Tony Aomi had already cut his fingers off working in the, in the factory. I don't want to lose my whole hand, thanks. Yeah, you know, and this, so everybody suddenly realized every musician who's come through here has told us the same thing. John Lodge was here from the Moody. Everybody said you could really do this as a career, and our parents, because of the Beatles, well, they didn't want us to. They kind of went, well, what else has he got? And everybody talked about Strict Aunt Mimi with John Lennon saying, you're not allowed to rehearse with your friends unless you finish school. And everybody, hey, you know, she, I didn't, I didn't respect her because she didn't treat me like a genius. But she was doing the right thing mm -hmm. to assume that, that, you know, this your sister's child that you've taken in is going to change the world and become one of the richest men in the world. It's like saying you're going to win the Powerball. I'm sure he will. The, the odds were so against it. She did the right thing. Try to have your kid finish school and get going, you know, just like your dad. I, not out of being nasty, but he wants to make sure you're okay. But it, I, do you take it that he didn't believe in your talent, or is he just being pragmatic and you weren't? It was Like you said, it was unfathomable that you could play a guitar and make a living. Or he'd say you're going to end up like Miles Davis, who... You know what I mean? Oh, these guys shoot heroin, or you're a drunk playing in a bar. Everybody's going to buy you a beer. I didn't drink. I didn't do drugs. So that wasn't that wasn't even an all uh, an option for me. It was just it was what I did. People said if you weren't a successful guitar player, what would you be? And I would say an unsuccessful <laughs> guitar player. I would just be playing guitar. But if you do it long enough, the guys who quit end up paying to come and see you. <laughs> the guys used to trip me and bully me in school come now to gigs would bring their kids and grandkids so remember us in grade 12 or in first year of college yeah weren't you the guy that used to trip me every morning and take my lunch money right you know right and suddenly yeah we knew you would do it what, what janice joplin voted the ugliest boy in port arthur texas and then they're all running to come see her you know to see her shows when she becomes janice joplin right. the coolest chick in the world and you know, for all that, that Lennon boy, stay away from that Lennon boy, you know, because he's trouble. Yeah, he sure is trouble. Look at all the trouble he caused. He even got on the enemy's list of the United States government. That's how much trouble he caused. Yeah. And here we are still talking about it. Randy Bachman is my special guest. There's a great, great documentary that's out. Um, it's on iTunes, Prime Video, and Amazon Prime, Google Pro Play, and DVD. And I mean it. I We've known each other for a long time, and I learned more from this documentary that I didn't know. Me too. Uh, so how come was, Ken wasn't in the documentary? Yeah, how come was I wasn't because he was not Canadian? Ask Wait, John Barnum. May, w did you need more Canadian content? Why wasn't Jimmy Page in the documentary? <laughs> I don't know. Why wasn't Elvis in? I don't know. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Well, they had Chris Elvis Jericho. Elvis used my song. I mean, TCB, let's... <laughs> You know. so, Alex that Lifeson is, was in there. Yeah, I get Alex Lifeson. I get Neil Young. Neil was great in the documentary. Yeah, he was good. He's, that was a surprise. That was, so what did you learn... 
from the documentary that, I mean, it's your life. It's got to be the weirdest thing in the world. Yeah. It would be for me. It would be for Andrew. be for anybody listening. If you suddenly came home and said, honey, there's a documentary about your life on Amazon. You want to watch it? I would just cringe in a fetal position. I would be terrified to kind of watch it, even though I know the cameras were on me. What surprised you about this? Um, I saw it once at the Indie Doc Fest in Toronto, I guess with last fall. We all went there. But there were so many flash bulbs and lights going off and so much people, I don't really remember a whole lot of it. Yeah, because you're in the, you're in the yeah, event. It's yeah, an it's event. Like it's not. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, and I haven't seen it since. So it's like you said, it's like there's a cringe factor in there. Like, how many times do you want to see your home movies when you went on vacation with your parents to, like, Yellowstone and you fell in the water? Do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? Like, these old family pictures. You've seen them already. So, like, I really haven't seen it. Some of the biggest takeaways to me from that documentary, and it it's something that comes up, I think, because there are two friends of ours, uh, Black Rabbit. Raheem and Amiri Taylor. Oh, yeah. It's a young band. They're, they're twins, African-Americans. They've been on Q104.3. Uh, and it's sort of like you suddenly happen. They're busking in the tube station, you know, in the train station here in New York. And people film them. They're throwing some money in their hat. They said, one day we made like 500 bucks. It was the biggest day we ever had. People were throwing 20s. But we made a couple hundred bucks doing it every day. And because they sang beautiful Beatles songs. And a guy videotapes them and says, you're going to be famous. Okay, you know, on his phone. Turns out he's an influencer blogger, and they wake up the next morning, they come to have breakfast, and their father goes, come here. You see this? Yeah. You got 20 million views. Goes, what? Yeah. Yesterday, did you go play in the subway? Yeah, there's 20 million people. And Ellen DeGeneres calls. Hey, we want you on the show. And as a kid said, the first interview we ever did in our lives was on national television, and the first time we were ever exposed was not in your studio. Here at Q, we, I was, we were on national TV, he said, we're suddenly, hey, can you tour? Can you play? Can you do this? He goes, we, the most we got was taking the subway from Far Rockaway. You know, it's, and I, we've, every musician has said, when it's, when you're up, you're up, you know, like shaking all over when it's people spend their whole lives looking for that little bit of daylight, you know, the quarry men. And we were talking about the, the Nurk twins when John and Paul at Johnny and the moon dogs. And then when you're playing in the basement, in the lunchtime show at the cavern, and then Brian takes them to, takes the tapes to London and nobody wants to sign them. So he tries again and the comedy producer takes a shot and then it happens and you're on a rocket just holding on for dear life like these kids are. They called me the other day and I introduced Randy to them. They said, um, we just got a call to play something called Glastonbury. Have you ever heard of this? Yes. Should we do that? Yes. Do you have passports? No. Like you have to get a guy. You're at that point now, get a guy, because you're not going to decide the day before. You have to have a guy plan this for you, because it's so far past. You know, it just started. You went from playing the subway to invited to Glastonbury. you got to catch up. <laughs> and one of the things in this documentary, it's hysterical. These two guys did their first tour. They toured three weeks. And I said to Raheem, how'd it go? And I think I told you this, Andrew. And he said, we toured three weeks. It was grueling. It was tough. I mean, you have to travel every day. And I mean, every day you have to get in this car and you have to get dressed and you have to go to a sound check. You have to eat. You you know, you really have to think about when you're going to eat and when you're going to sleep. And I didn't know that. I mean, we were worn out. Fast forward to this documentary on Randy Bachman. TCB is, is up. How many dates a year did you play? 300, one year, 330 the next year, 320 the next year. No and words. recorded albums in the spare times off and those things. We have, we'd have like 10 days off, five days would be in the studio. We did an album in five days then. Each album, BTO one, two, three, in five days. And then five days at home. Andrew, which we're done with laundry and packing. <laughs> Andrew McNaught, just to repeat, the man played 330 dates a year. I haven't played that, that many in my life. <laughs> just say it. Just and, and our album is in its third year of production. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, first of all, you can't afford to go home. You're driving in a car. So you, you're making four or 500 bucks a night. That's enough to get you to the next city. You don't have enough gas to get home. In our rider, we would put, uh, rather than food, yeah. JCPenney's 
uh, triple, you get three white T-shirts in a pack and three white socks in a pack. You throw away your clothes. You don't have time to do laundry. You got a couple of pair of jeans and you get every three or four days in your your rider in your dressing room in your club, you get new Penny, J.C. Penny's T-shirts and socks. <laughs> That's how you're clean on the road and you never go home. That Write that down, Andrew. That's a good one. That's a, that's also ask for nine volt batteries. They're great in your rider. Oh, then you yeah. power your batteries. Your foot pedals are powered all the time. Mm-hmm. This is no. This is really good stuff. This is for real. These are brilliant little tricks. Yeah. The things like the kids wouldn't even know to go like, hey, I'm wearing the same clothes. Like always, put the salt in your hand first before your eggs, because somebody will loosen the thing when you go like that. <laughs> all the salt will come off on your eggs. And there's no money Never for a second Never shake your order. ketchup unless you hold the top on because you're going to hit the ceiling because somebody's leave the mustard or the ketchup top off. All these things in a restaurant. Uh, brilliant stuff. That one of the When they were first starting, uh, Mark Rivera was here, our, our dear friend, and Mark said, your twins, your brothers, yeah, when you go to lunch, sit at different tables. He said, you, you just sit at different tables. You can't all fit in one table. Each of you sit at a different table with a different band member. Why? He goes, just trust me. Just... <laughs> I mean, you toured with your brothers, you know, and everybody, it's a, one of the things is that the Beatles broke up after seven years, the pressure cooker of it. And Andrew and I were here with Peter Asher, who just said, the, as hard as we worked, and I don't, he said, I, bands do work hard, but most of the bands that work that hard, most are still the classic rock bands who are touring. He said, but the, the, in, the intensity, the compactness of how being with somebody all the time he said, you just eat each other alive. You can't help it. You come down for breakfast and go, you had to wear that shirt again? He said, and that's what happened. You know, Gordon and I were best friends. You just can't be. It's just, it just, we were friends. The stupid, every single thing that drove us apart is meaningless. Except if you were doing it year in, year out, they become mountains. Right. Is, do you find uh, that just, a- I hear the same thing when people are going, when people are breaking up. Yeah. Everything that attracted you to that woman and vice versa is now what, you hate and it pisses you off and it, you explode. It's it's too much com- compactness and right. too much sameness. But at least with a job, even a crazy job like I have, I come here to the station to work, then I go home to change. So I still have a separation of work life right. and home life. When you're on the road with a band, that's... I'll that's, get you being in a band with your brothers. That you've been with them since they've been born and you're still with them when you're 25. Was that... And you're still looking after them. You're still changing dirty diapers. <laughs> in every sense, in a metaphorical. Yeah, that's what I mean, metaphorically. Yeah. How, is that, was that tougher than anything of like touring with them? Yeah, and then you have this guilt feeling. Like my dad would say, okay, you're the oldest. You cut that pie into four pieces and you get the last choice. So if you can't make a big piece and take it yourself, you cut it in four and let your other three brothers pick one, two, three, and you get the piece that's left over. So you cut everything equal. right? You're, that kind of pressure's on you all the time, so. Wow. It's amazing that you survived. You know, that's what I say. It's amazing that bands survive as long as they do. Yeah. You know, Pete and Roger going out on a tour this summer, 2019. And, you know, it's not that they're not getting along now. They never really got along. No, they never did. <laughs> Same with Ray and, and Dave Davis. Oh, Dave's coming in later this week. Dave, wow. Dave's, uh, we, we're dear friends. He lives here in Long Island, right? Yeah, he's in New Jersey, actually. Yeah. Bounces back and forth. Individually, they're the kindest, coolest, sweetest guys in the world. You put these two in a room, and it's like those the Siamese fighting fish. Every little thing, put that away. No, move that. No, Ta- you know, sitting in a car, roll up the window, roll it down, turn it up, turn it down. It, they immediately be, go back to being like eight and ten years old, yeah. and they can't help it. Right. I mean, <laughs> and I've we we me and my kids went to see Sunny Afternoon. Was it a or brilliant? Waterloo Sunset? Whatever it was in yeah. London, the Kinks thing. Yeah, it was wonderful. But you see that brotherly tension in there and i'm very familiar with that as it was with the beach boys and and you know the davies and everybody else we said the robinson brothers of the black crows yeah couldn't do it it's it, it seems like it's harder when you're i mean obviously it's harder when it's it's family even in band well, there's another guy in a band you can have a punch up and you throw him out or you quit when it's your how do you quit your family it's like really really tough it is. Because guess who's watching you? Your dad and your mother. Like those are the, like the overseers. Like God and goddess are over watching you. You must look after your younger brothers, kind of thing. What do you mean you kicked your brother out of the bed? Yeah, exactly. Right. You don't want to deal with that. No, I had to do deal with that. How did it go? What happened with that? It didn't go very well. But I explained <laughs> to my dad like these are my rules. This is like my train. I'm paying everybody a salary. I gave everybody a break. 
and he keeps breaking the rules, and it's dangerous. I don't want to go to jail. It was a, it was a, you know a dope thing with my brother, so that was done. It's hard. Yeah, it's hard enough to do it to a bandmate, let alone the bandmate's name is Bachman. When you think about how how it went, so many people went. Paul McCartney, you have the Beatles. It breaks up. He has a nervous breakdown. You know, maybe I'm amazed. I'm a man going through something I really don't understand. The breakup of the greatest group that ever lived, and Andrew and I have always talked about. So here you are in 1970, 71. You have your choice. Who who wouldn't have said yes to Paul to put together another band? You get Clapton on guitar. You know, you get Chris Stanton. You could get Ginger Baker playing drums. Jack Bruce. You could get any the super group of British musicians. You could get at that point be amazing. And instead, you call Danny Lane and go, hey, we love the Moody Blues. We want to start another band? We're just putting together some guys. We're going to go on the farm in Scotland, and Linda will cook, and we'll drink some wine, see if we can write some songs. And literally, I'd rather restart it in a barn rather than just just put out the call and go, Paul's looking for a new group. Will the most famous people in the world line up? And like, you kind of did the same thing in a lot of ways. Fair to say? Well, I, first of all, when I left the Guess Who, I was kind of blackballed in the industry, and nobody would work with me. Why? Uh, well, because I had left the band who was number one, and was I an idiot, and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and then and they said they threw me out, and I said I quit, you know? Right. By the time, you, you were the guy by the time your boss fires you, you're ready to quit. I mean, it's that bad. By the time your wife says, don't come home tonight, you're ready to not go home that night. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> that's just the way life goes. <laughs> Sleeping on the couch, yeah, I love the couch, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I like sleeping in the dog house. The dog's my best friend, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and so by the time that happens, and then so like I had nobody to choose from. Nobody in Winnipeg would work with me. I was the big loser. And so like who do I go to? My younger brothers. My younger brother played drums. He didn't have a drum set. He played on pots and pans. And you know those Quaker oats, those round yeah. things? Well, I would get those, the big round things. I'd cut them in different lengths and put... Uh, scotch tape on them. And those, so want to be bigger than the other. He'd play with wooden spoons. And then I go to cut the album and nobody will drum with me. So I asked my brother, Rob, will he drum? And he said, well, I don't have drums. I'm going to go and borrow a set from Gary Peterson, the Guess Who's drummer, which were an old drums, Ludwig drums that had real skin on. Not the fake D- Remo drum heads. Real skin, animal skin. Wow. So Robbie gets these drums and he plays for them about a week and we, he cuts Bray Belt 1. And I tell him exactly what to play. Ringo, Charlie Watts, real simple drum stuff, like not, no rocket science, no John Bonham or Keith Moon stuff. Um, that was it. That became us. So I, I played with my brothers, and then some. Some of them were. Some of it worked out, and when it didn't work out, I then got another powerhouse, which was Fred Turner, the man with the Harley Davidson voice. How did you find Fred? Well, I knew him from earlier. There was like. In every band, and you will notice this, you know a lot of bands, one or two guys stands out. They are the driven ones, they're the creative ones. The other guys are there for the party, they're there for the chicks or whatever, or they're there because they have nothing else better to do. But when you've got to practice every day, a couple hours a day, they don't show up or they show up late, and pretty much you throw them out of the band. I've thrown three leaders out of the bands because they would rather, well, we're on stage playing sleepwalk, they'd rather go and dance with their girlfriend than be on stage. So it's like, why am I in a band with this guy? Throw them out of the band. And so you got to be serious. So when you get a bunch of guys like that together, you kind of move forward. And um, so I knew Fred Turner because the guys who stood out in the Squires was Neil Young. The guy who stood out in the uh, Devrons was Burton Cummings. The guy who stood out in the, guess who, was me. The guy who stood out in the Rockin' Devils was Fred Turner. So there was the four, these four guys that I knew. And the reason we knew each other, none of us had cars. Our parents didn't have cars. So on a Friday night at like 5 o'clock, I would get on a bus in the north end of Winnipeg with a Harmony amp and a guitar and a gunny sack like Johnny B. Good. Two stops later, Gary Peterson would get on with a rockin' drum set. But then you had a great big thing. A great big one that was your kick drum was in and your tom tom and you had a trap case that your snare went in and your hi hat and he got on with those two and as we're transferring downtown who's transferring going the other way Fred Turner and the Devils or Neil Young and the Squires we're all taking the bus and if you're at the dance and you're really good some guy with a car would say do you guys need a ride home and luckily because the buses stopped at eleven or eleven thirty in Winnipeg we would get a ride home with a guy in a car or else it's, you're, you're trying to take a taxi and it's all your money's gone. You've been ma- paid maybe 20 bucks a night for five guys, four or five guys, and that goes to the taxi to get you home. So I, we, I knew all these guys. 
And I knew Fred was serious. I knew he had this great voice. He used to sing Host of the Rising Sun, and this was the voice I wanted. A guy that voice sounded like a dump truck or a Harley Davidson, a giant voice. Because I'm competing with the great voice of Burton Cummings, that when I've left, he's gone forward to share the land and everything else, and he's got one of Canada's great rock voices. But I was lucky to find the other great rock voice. To get to in the world. By the way, Andrew, so taking the bus with a drum kit, that sounds like fun every night. Lugging a drum kit around in a trailer is not fun, so I can only imagine what it was like putting it in a in a bus and rolling it down the aisle while everyone, yeah. you know. Yeah. Hey, watch would... that. Watch that thing. What, what's the bus driver new? It's just like Ralph Grandin. <laughs> Every Friday at 4.30, hey, guys, back of the bus. The back of the bus, because there's one big seat across the back. We would put all our gear put in there the and sit in the middle, yeah. You know, when they always talk about, like, going back to the Beatles, you know, why Neil Aspinall and Mal Evans, what was their magic? The magic was that Mal had a Mal was big and strong and could schlep the equipment. And he had, had a van. Yeah, yeah. Who was it? Ros- Ozzy Osbourne, right? Singer with Van and PA, <laughs> right? Oh, that's with, oh, okay, we got our manager because he has a station wagon and he bought a little PA. That was our manager. He picked us up and dropped us off after we got over the bus deal. A, a guy finally came and said, "I got a station wagon." I'm a convict. I need something to keep me out of jail, literally. <laughs> and I, I've invested my money in a in a little PA system. So I'll drive you guys around, set up the PA. Wonderful. You're our manager. You're hired. <laughs> Give them 10 bucks a night. Basically, you did it to fill the gas tank in those days. All right. It was all just for fun. Roger Earl from Fog Hat set right where you were. And Andrew and I asked him, if if you had a choice, there's a, 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 very good, a really good bass player that you could put in your band or... A, a guy who could barely play, but he's got a big van. Who do you hire? And he just went, oh, there's no question about it. I can teach you four notes on a bass, and we'll get through the show. The van is the most important yeah. thing. The rest we can make. We'll fi- I'll show you how to do it good enough so that you don't get booed off the stage or throw it. At least you won't throw us off. If you can play G and in in a D, right. we'll work it out. Right. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I got it. And everyone tells that story about just the, just getting from gig to gig. I did that with my brother because I couldn't find a bass player. I said, here's an old guitar of mine. I'm taking off two strings. I'm putting on four bass strings. You can play it with, with mitts on. <laughs> Put a mitt and you just play a low E. You can play with, like, with mitts. You don't, need not, you don't need no dexterity. Just boom, boom, boom. A Beatle thing. Everybody wanted Paul McCartney bass and Ringo Starr drum. Because over that b- Mersey beat bottom, you could put anything. Wild stuff or real simple rhythm guitars, it all fits. So, like the Mersey, that's what Creedence Clearwater had. They had that Mersey beat. Every song was boom, 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 no matter what, no matter what the tempo was. That was it. Wow, Andrew, try that. Play with mittens next time you guys do a show. He's a bass player. We've done that. We played outside, like at the Grey Cup, which is like you know our football game in November outside. How cold! And the the best instrument to play then is drums. You're playing with mitts or bass. When you're playing guitar, I've got to get like. Shooters um, <laughs> things, or you cut the fingers out, right? So your knuckles are warm because when your knuckles get cold, that's what really hurts. And so your fingers are touching these strings. You can actually feel the strings moving under your fingers because the lights come on, they stretch, the lights go off, they, they contract, contract just like a bridge, you know, with the metal, and it's it's horrific. Yeah, I actually practice with fingerless gloves a lot of the time because our our basement rehearsal space gets pretty cold. <laughs> <laughs> There's like That's a little training. space heater. Whoever can can stand closest to the Everybody's space heater feels like it. feels like they're in pretty good shape, but everyone else just has to freeze. That's why out. Hendrix wrote Fire. He's rehearsing in a freezing castle, and he said, let me stand next to your fire. He's visiting a, 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 a girlfriend. You probably read this in the Hendrix book. Let me stand next to your fire. That's what it's all about. Yeah, yeah no, literally. Getting warm standing by the fireplace. Fire. Yeah. <laughs> Not sexual. No, you're fire. I'm freezing. Yeah. Randy Bachman is my guest. A great documentary out that's so much about life, about the road, and about you know how you do this, how it how it all happens. Um, like I said, the the pictures of you they found footage of you playing in the early bands. You got your Beatle haircut. You got the be- you have to see him in a Beatle haircut and the country that? gentleman guitar, the George Harrison guitar. Yeah, <laughs> you know it, it's so funny. Um, it was it was John Lodge who was here from the Moody Blues. Sees the Beatles. And said, hey, I want to play bass. He goes to the music store. Hey, I want a, an electric bass guitar. Goes, we don't have anything like that. They didn't even have one in Birmingham. You know, so you're trying to make one or find a place to do it. Billy J. Kramer said, "Why? you know, everybody's like, the Hofner. Why did Paul pick the Hofner? The interesting, because the high end. He goes, no, it was it was the only one we could afford. There's one music store in, in Liverpool. 
And there was stuff, the expensive stuff was up on the top of the shelf behind a, a glass case. We couldn't touch that. But this was the guitar we all bought because that was the cheapest, and the cheapest bass guitar was the violin bass. And it's symmetrical. You yeah. played upside down, it was the same. Other, other basses were offset. You played upside down, it would look weird. It was like Hendrix looked weird playing the white strat upside down. Yeah. But it's worse on a bass. Yeah, and, you know, all the all the the... If you played it, the low notes on it went out of tune real easy, right? right. So everybody said he he walked up so many times just to try to right. keep it in tune and not have to retune during songs. And it influences... Well, Hoffman bass is the hardest one to keep in tune. Yeah. And that's why Paul played some of the riffs he played. When he went out of that little four or five fret comfort zone, it was sharper flat. <laughs> so part of his sound and what he played was like staying in this thing where he would be in tune. Because I've seen Hoff most guitars, you know, they're... The bridge is like this way, you know, perpendicular, uh, standing upright, like right. 90 degrees to the ground. On a Hofner, you got to tilt your bridge like this, so your intonation is in. It's really a hard instrument to stay in tune. It was fretted wrong, or something was wrong way back when. If you look at McCarthy's thing, his base, his bridge is always sideways, and then you can play in a certain area. You go down too low or too high, the pitch is out. The <laughs> octave doesn't work. It's amazing, and he's been using it ever since. Um, speaking of guitars, in this documentary. You go to your storage locker and go through some of those classic guitars. Yeah. Um, talk about a couple of the great guitars that you have. So, so, give me, um, uh, like well, there's my American Woman 1959 Les Paul Burst with the Bigsby on it. That one I played on American Woman. Um, a couple of guitars, one that Chet Atkins sent me. That's a prototype because I had lost my orange Gretsch. That's what started me in my Gretsch hunger to find my guitar you know my quest, impossible quest i never did find the guitar i think the guy in the thompson twins has it the blonde guy and dr doctor <laughs> he's playing my orange gretch so if you, know, how if you, how if you know this you? guy call him and say i'm looking for him give him my email he was here, i'll pay he him was exactly like what he paid ago. for it he was yeah the guy from the thompson twins yeah. did he have bachman's guitar not with him we no. should have beaten him up but like, i mean if he comes back we can mention it so there's like a couple of, there's some that they're the only one in the world I got some one of a kind guitars. Did you basically keep all your guitars over your career? Did, did you I want? sell? Did you sell some along the way, or did you say uh, after, no? I know I want to keep. After this about one? thirty years of madness of trying to find my Gretsch guitar, I had three hundred and fifty Gretsch guitars, and Fred Gretsch called me, and he said, "I hear you have a Gretsch collection." Yes, I do. I just got the Gretsch name back, and I can make Gretsch guitars again. They've been sold in corporate sell-offs. Right. I can now make Gretsch guitars. May I come and see your guitars? Sure you can. He brings Pete from Pete's Rare Guitars in Minneapolis. They come and see my guitars. And he says, okay, now I have a question. Will you let, can I borrow your guitars one at a time and copy them? Because our factory burnt down. I, have any, I don't have any templates to shape the guitars. I don't have the measurements or the blueprints. And I said, okay, you can take two or three at a time. Please insure them and then send them back to me. So every Gretsch guitar that's out now in every store in the world is, is a copy of what was wow. in my collection. And then probably after three or four years of that, he then calls me up and he says, Fender's got a museum, Gibson's got a museum, in Germany, Hofner's got a museum, Rickenbacker's museum, you own my museum. Can I purchase it from you? And I said, yeah. At the time, I mean, when you have 385 guitars and you're playing other ones on stage, you never get, you can't even play one a, one a day for a whole year. You, you forget them. And I said, yeah, well, I'll, I'll sell them to you. So he came and had them evaluated and... uh I have, a, I have a film of this, which nobody's ever seen, of taking it out of my barn, looking at it, going, I got this from Chet Atkins, this is an Eddie Cochran, this is Eddie Cochran's Gretsch guitar strap, blah, 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 and it's gone to Fred Gretsch. Uh, he lent 150 of them to the Nashville Music Hall of Fame on Music Row there in Nashville. They were there for two years, and everybody from Vince Gill to, you know, Brent Mason all went in to see them and play the guitars and stuff. So they're now in Savannah, Georgia. So I sold those 300, 385 Gretsches to Fred Gretsch, and that money allowed me to buy a flat in London, in Covent Garden. That is a well done. And, you know, part of the thing, uh, like when Lenny Kravitz was here and he sold a lot of his guitars, yeah. he collected. And he just said, you know what? These things are meant to be played, not to be looked at on the wall, not to be kept in a storage room under pressure. He goes, they're, they're, instru they're works of art, but they should, some kid should have this in his hands yeah. and should twang the crap out of it and make a song because yeah. that's what they were born to do. And he said, I started feeling guilty about, hey, I've got all these guitars. Like, yeah, but I'm not. And he said the same thing. But I'm not playing 200 guitars. I've got four that I seem to be playing all the time. And thank God I could buy more if I want. 
I'm I'm just going to sell them. But you have to play them. I'm not selling them just to a, a collector to put on the wall next to his right. golf trophy. It's got to go to a musician or something. Or go to a museum so the Vin skills of the world right. can go, hey, can I pull that down so, and play it? So the ones I have now have about 150, 180 German art stops, all handmade, all hand-carved. From about the early 50s to the early 60s. Then Gibson took over with all the Chuck Berry, you know, the big Gibsons. And uh, so those these were made one at a time in Germany after the war. Because all the guys who made symphonic instruments, there was no symphonies anymore. All the symphony houses had been bombed. What existed with the hot club with Django playing? So there, a lot of these guys that trained at the Stradivari factory in Italy were now making archtop guitars. Father, son, carving it out of wood from the Black Forest behind the Iron Curtain with bootlegged and black market parts. And so I've collected all these. And now there's such works of art. The museum in Calgary is now cataloging them and they're going to put them on tour. They're going to go to the Royal Ontario Museum of Fine Arts, ROM it's called, in in Toronto and then to Montreal and then Ottawa. So it'll be on tour as my guitar collection. And Fred Gretsch has a museum, but it's called the Randy Bachman Gretsch Guitar Collection. And it's not just as works of art, but it changes the music and it changes how you write and how you play. Going back to the Beatles, you know, George gets the 12 string Rickenbacker, the sound of the band changes. Yeah. Paul, you know, the Hofner, not that he doesn't use it, but now we've got a fancy bass. It gets the Ricky Rickenbacker bass. Gets the Rick bass. And I don't I don't think Sergeant Peppers would have sounded the same on a Hofner. Like, no. you've got to get that different bass to create a different sound. And you talk about not just the production and the special effects or the backwards masking or the double tracking. When you change your instruments, and Andrew, I think you'll agree, on any band, even from 100,000 to BTO to the Beatles, you change your instruments, how you, what you write, how you play it, how you record is going to change. Right. Fair? Instruments have a personality. And how I got a lot of these guitars, a guy would bring it to the gig. I'd say, I've got a 59 Les Paul, whatever it would be called, or a 59 Gretsch, and I would plug it in, and with the first thing I would play, if I, if the band looked at me and goes, what's that? Is that a new song? Yes, it is. I'll buy the guitar. How much? <laughs> 300 bucks there, because I know from that 300, I'm going to make three grand or 30 grand from writing this song, because the guitar is like, tells you these chords. So I remember buying chords and playing the beginning to Sledgehammer, which is on um, a, a Not Fragile album. That, uh, uh, like, it's my all right now chords, right? And Sledgehammer. And so I buy this 59 Les Paul for $250. I sold it later because the kid really wanted it for 10000 And because that happens with all the guitars. You get a guitar and it, it makes you play and or a certain chord or something just jumps out of the guitar. There's certain sounds in each instrument that it just says, this is what I like to do. Like the guitar telling you, hey, this is where I fit best. This is my sound for the instrument. Well, I always think... Going back to the Stones, Street Fighting Man, as angry a song as you could ever write, and Keith grabs an acoustic. Ta da! What, what would make it? It's the thing, of, you know, if I could get nerdy music with Keith, go, why would you grab an acoustic and think that that is going to be the angriest sound? That's what you hear on this with the big echoey floor tom. Ta doom, ba! And it works perfectly. It's the last choice you would think anybody would make, and it's a brilliant choice. And here we are, we're still playing it. When it, when you turn around the the different the thing about the Guess Who and even BTO is that as you said you couldn't pin it down. I love jazz and a rock band that plays that hard and you playing jazz guitar. It, you would think that it's a completely different band that plays Undone or These Eyes that also plays American Woman and even you know we get to BTO and Blown and Stone Gates <laughs> the. I was listening to it the first time. I can still remember sitting with my friend Frank. He was listening to a new BTO album. And you go off on this Les Paul, Lenny Bro, yeah. Jazz Riff 15. I'm like, what the hell is that? What? How does that finish this song? And you, it's as if the song stops and now we're just we're, we're going off on Les Paul, How High the Moon, and just flying on it. Like, this is just the coolest band I've ever heard because who else would do that? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, but I, you know, it's like it. It's only for people like who are, have an open mind. It just like a song shouldn't finish like that, but it did, and that's why I'll never forget it and love it. And the playing was great. You're talking about Welcome Home. Yeah. Da 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 da
enter this big. Heavy- and you know what? I just heard all that stuff again because uh-huh. they they now we've now remastered the whole BTO box set. It's coming out soon on Uni Music. Is it really? Yes, fantastic. And it really does sound amazing. I sent letters to all the guys, Fred, Blair, Robbie, and Tim, saying, I just sat through the remastering of this. We were really a good band. The album cuts, like you said, Blown and Stone Gates, we were like in a weird southern country rock thing there. We were touring with the Allman Brothers and Charlie Daniels all down south because nobody in Canada would play us. We were, we were, I was the reject from the Guess Who, so we hooked it. We were playing, touring with Hank Williams Jr. and the Allman Brothers and all that stuff. And uh, we, there's some really great southern rock in there. And they got into heavier rock with Not Fragile, but the first two albums were like weird, jazzy, country, cabin jazz <laughs> with rock and roll blues in there. It's, I don't think I've told Andrew this story, but Randy knows it. The first rock concert I ever saw was at the Academy of Music <laughs> on 14th Street. And my, my friend's older brother was the bouncer there in the thing. And the show was Commander Cody and the Lost Planet Airman with the headliners. He had Hot Rod Lincoln. And the opening act was this really cool band from Canada called Bachman Turner Overdrive, who just released their second album. And this great song called Let It Ride, that same thing. Starts with a nice acoustic guitar, great riffs. And I went, I thought, you know, I think I'm going to wind up like in... Bachman Turner Overdrive more. So that was the first rock concert I had ever seen was this man sitting here, and he still remembers it as the and weirdest I gig. do remember that because we go there, and we're in New York City, and I'm going, I come on stage and I go, are you ready to rock? And this is, believe me, they were aptly named. The Lost Planet, and the audience was lost. I come, and the whole audience had been smoking grass for like two hours, and they're sitting in their seats like this, like a Grateful Dead concert, and I'm going, let's rock, and nobody responds. And we, are you ready to rock and roll? And it's like dead quiet. <laughs> like, I just sitting, like Cheech and Chong at the end of a the night. They're sitting in the chair. They're all asleep. And then suddenly they woke up when when Commander Cody came out and he did Hot Rod Lincoln. But it was like really weird. So I remember that very well. Like here we are in New York City. We're going to rock. It's going to be like the Who at Madison Square Gardens. And we were more like, like Donald Duck in, in Disneyland, you know. But, well, well there's, there was a little boy in the balcony who really appreciated that. Well, that's <laughs> so, good. It was me. It was you and me. Yeah. He was ready to rock. I was I was 15, but I, hell, I was ready to rock, I'm telling you. Randy Bachman's been a guest. Um, this documentary covers everything. How to be a band, how to start, what happened, how it ca- came apart, how it went together, your home life, your kids, Tal and Lorelai, and how it comes back together. Music, you know, when that song, Rock Is My Life. That could have been the subtitle of this documentary. I used to I play that song on stage, and I've had Paul Rogers, the guys from Heart, the guitar players just stand there and get verklempt. They get like tear thing. That song is our anthem. Rock is my life, it and is. this is my song. When you come into a new town, everybody's there. When we play our music, hands are in the air. When the music's over, you wonder where they're, they are standing in the silence with my old guitar. That's it. And it's like, this is our song. And then it's like, rock is my life. Okay, I want to finish. There's so many great stories. We've done the TCB story on the air many times. And you've talked about how the chord came together and the song came together. It's one of my favorite songs. You know, Andrew, so, you know, you're competing to get high school dances. The Squires with Neil Young, Randy's band. Would you share the story with young Andrew, with the listeners, one more time about the first time you heard your friend Neil Young's album of Buffalo Springfield? Well, <laughs> and we, Neil's I, in this documentary, by the way, and he loves Randy, so it's all good. I had come to New York with the Guess Who, Louis Louis 65, Summer. We're at Scepter Studios. It's fantastic. We meet Florence Greenberg, who owns the label. Uh, she manages Sherelle. She wrote Soldier Boy. Her songwriters are Backrack and David and Ashford and Simpson. It's really a fantastic thing. Uh, what did you ask me? <laughs> oh, about the first time you heard Buffalo Springfield, okay. and you talked oh, yeah. about the vocalists. So I get back from, uh, from Winnipeg. Uh, from there, and I come back home, and Neil's there, and he says, "I've got, I've got a new band," because he said, "I said you got to get out of Winnipeg. We're out of Winnipeg. We're touring with the Kingsmen. We're playing with the On the Belmont, Sam the Sham, the Turtles, everybody else. You got to get out of town. When, he, when you're in Winnipeg, getting out of town, you either go south to Minneapolis, west to Regina, or east to Thunder Bay. He goes to Thunder Bay, a place of coffee house called the Fourth Dimension, and he meets Stephen Stills there." And they go to L.A. and start Buffalo Springfield. So he gets, I get a message from him. I'm back with my new band, Buffalo Springfield. I said, it sounds like a tractor. He says, it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tractor company. And he says, I got something to play. And he has a white acetate. And he plays me the first song. And I go, wow, what a voice. 
Well, that's Stephen Stills. I love the huskiness of his voice and the scratchiness. Guitar playing, acoustic and electric guitar. The guy's amazing on guitar. Plays me the next track. His beautiful high voice, uh, Richie Fure. Wow, what a voice. And he plays the next song that goes, Out of my mind, <laughs> and I just can't take it anymore. And I go, Who's that? And he goes, It's me. <laughs> I go, What? You're singing? Because all he did was play lead guitar. I'm going to pick. He sang one song, and I was lead guitar too. So I'm amazed. I'm thinking, what you're singing? He said, Yeah, have you heard this guy, Bob Dylan? You don't have to hit the notes right on anymore. <laughs> Nobody cares. Just write really good lyrics and enunciate them so people hear. It's the poetry, man. It's not hitting the notes. And um, jokingly, I say that on stage. I still use that template to this day, as does Neil, as did Leonard Cohen, and of course, Celine Dion does too. You know, I get a big yeah. laugh over that. No, I mean, she's perfect pitch. <laughs> I just say that for a laugh. Uh, touring with the Kingsman, Louis Louis. All right, I'm going to leave. Do you know the story about how Louis Louis and how you couldn't understand the lyrics? When I was with them, the FBI came and raided the concert. They wanted the lyrics written down. Did you hear how that whole thing happened? Yeah. About with the microphone up on, up high? Well, what happened was they recorded in three track. We recorded there too in Minneapolis. Yeah. And if you play a three track on a two tack machine, one of the tracks comes out lower. So the vocal came out lower. Nobody could understand it. That's the, what I heard. The, the story I had heard, I got this from Mark Lindsay and the Raiders. Everybody was doing Louie Louie up there. And they recorded it, and it came out perfect. And he told me, that the lead singer of the Kingsman, I, I can't think of his name offhand. Lynn Easton. Uh, yeah. Lynn Eastman. And he had braces on his teeth. And the owner of the studio had a brand new Neumann mic. That is the fancy multi-thousand dollar, fifteen thousand dollar mic. Looked at the braces on his teeth and went, oh, no, no, you're not spitting all over my mic. Here, I'm putting it up here. Oh. He goes, well, I can't. He goes, well, reach for it. Louie, Louie. Oh, baby. We got it. And the band's playing. It's one mic. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And they couldn't understand what he's saying, that it was buried. And everybody thought he said a dirty word. Yeah. I got to go there. But he's got braces. The mic's up. The three track to two track. I got to air. Wait, wait. He must have. And it was the greatest thing that ever yeah. happened to him. The greatest thing that ever happened to that band was thinking that he said a dirty That's word. That's like in the we song. did Shake on All Over with one mic. <laughs> they did Louie Louie with one mic. The drums are too loud. You move the entire drum set back. Right. There's no volume where you bring down the kick or the snare. You stand here. There's one mic and you're miking the room basically, and the band is performing, and you're recording a performance by a band, not one guy piecemealing a thing to a solo together. Is and you listen to it back, and you pick the version. With the least amount of mistakes. Because everybody's <laughs> making mistakes. You're doing it late at night. You don't know what you're doing. It's a brand new song. We should all record our hits after we've played them for two years. But it's funny. You write a song. You play it up front. And nobody knows it. You're looking at each other like you're going, D, F. You're, you're, you're <laughs> mouthing the chords and you're playing it. After you've played it for years, you can play it way smoother and way better. But it's really funny how you go in and you record a song that nobody knows. Right. Think about the Beatles recording that first album in one day. Yes. One day. But they had played the crap. They had played that set forever. They just said, like, George Martin said, play your set twice, and he picked the best version. And that's why John blew his voice doing Twist and Shout. It was the last song he did of the day. He said, I'm going to blow my pipes, and he did Twist and Shout. And then I've got a thing with George Martin saying, can you do another one? And John going, no, no, I can't. <laughs> I can't do another one. Go see this movie, Randy Bachman. Well, you don't have to go see it. It's going to come to you. It's on iTunes, Prime Video, Google Play. The DVD is out. It is a story not just of Randy's life, but of classic rock, of music, and you sharing you one of the greatest storytellers I know. Thank you so much for coming by, Randy Thanks, Bachman. Ken. Thank you, Cousin Kenny. <laughs> My cousin in New York. <laughs> New York's classic rock, Q1043.